What's going on, everybody? It's the Tom Rowland Podcast, brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee, and we are on part two of Paul Bork. As you remember from last week, if you were here last week, Paul Bork is an angler that was on Team USA fly fishing. He, he competed internationally. He was also the coach of the youth team, and he has... Uh, Drift Media, who's done a lot of work for many of the brands that you know. You've probably seen his work, whether you know you have or not. And stay tuned because Paul does share a lot of cool stories and some really good information. So this is part two with Paul Bork. I'm Paul Bork, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Where did you get the expertise on brands? It sounds crazy, but but Googling it and just paying attention, like looking at the brands, the thing about somebody that's successful at something, especially in the larger brands like Red Bull or Under Armour or whatever, is they're going to tell you about it. And they write articles. They tell you exactly what they did. They want to, whether it be pride or ego, it doesn't matter. The information was out there. So I started just paying attention and reading and looking at visually what moved me and why did that move me? Like, and then you start learning basics. You know, Joe Humphrey says the basics practice to perfection make champions. Well, the basics of a brand is your brand is what people say about you when you aren't in a room. Like the basics of lifestyle is if you want to be there in that photo, it is lifestyle. So once I started learning the basics and could apply it to the things that moved me, then I was able to start building my own style of what branding and marketing hmm. was. Just being a nerd. That's super interesting. Well, that's interesting because it's it 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 ha, you, there's that current there's a similar theme to everything that we've talked about is that basically you didn't know much you were interested in it you immersed yourself in in something mm -hmm. for a, for a period of time and you got really good at something very fast and you did that with with fly fishing you did it with in, international competition you did it with the coaching you're now doing it with the branding. So it's there's a couple of things that I that I want to talk about. The first thing that I've talked about a whole bunch of times and it if I've had any any uh, success in my fishing career, I kind of attribute it to this um, weakness is strength, right? So oh, yeah. when I first got down to the I mean, what does that mean to you? I don't want to I don't want to put words in your mouth, but what does that mean when I say weakness is strength? and apply it to what we've talked about today. What, what does that mean to you? To me, what comes to mind immediately is people, A, they don't, aren't willing to be honest with themselves about what they're bad at. And B, they're, they're afraid to fail. And like, it, it seems, it's very condensed, like the story we've had, like that seven or eight years. And I'm proud of the things I did. You know, I was there when Hook and Nomad started. I was part of that. I've done some really cool stuff. But I failed a lot. And I think that people play it too conservative and they're not willing to fail. And to me, I'm more interested in how did you pivot? Like, okay, well, that didn't work. W what are we going to do different about it? I don't care that you failed. That's fine. What's unacceptable to me is like, okay, well, we tried to do this thing and it sucked. And if we keep doing the same thing again, like, then we do suck, in fact. So I'm, I'm like, obsessively interested in how do we pivot and make it better and how do I get a little bit better each day and to me it's like just be willing to fail and be willing to be honest with it's why I go still to this like it's why I'm driving to Florida right now like I'm not God's gift to Florida like I love that I don't have a beat that it's wide open and I can do whatever I want to do and it happens or it doesn't it's the same thing. Like mm -hmm. I'm willing to fail. And I see that even professionally now is people, they want to get it right so bad that they play like conservative baseball. I'm just like, why do that? You know, I mean, I'm not saying be reckless, but a reasonable person knows the difference in aggression and recklessness. So yeah. be willing to fail. Like God, I've screwed up so much stuff that looking back, especially some content stuff, man, I would have done it a lot different. And that's not even including the equation that, content and distribution as we know it has done a 180 in the last eight years. We can take that mm -hmm. off the table. Uh, that's a whole nother story, but yeah, well that weakness is strength is, is kind of, it, you, that's a different take than, than what I was, what I was thinking. But I mean, when I first showed up out West, 
I was definitely the least experienced guide in the outfit, definitely the least experienced guide in the valley, uh, worst caster, um, didn't know how to row a boat. And I knew that that was my weakness. Like I knew that that's where I was. And so I had to work super hard at those things and it keeps you humble and it keeps you, um, learning. You have that white belt mentality to where everyone around you literally knows more than you do, including the people that work in the shop, including the, you know, the, the people that are, that are taking money at the boat ramp in everyone knows more than you. Or it, I, I knew that about me. And I kept that same kind of feeling for a while. Same thing happened in the Keys. I was the least experienced one there. I didn't have a father that was a was a fishing guide. My uncle wasn't a fishing guide. I didn't have come from a Rusty Albury family of, yeah. of a generational, you know, kind of thing where, where people grew up around the Keys. I knew nothing. And it wasn't, you know, maybe maybe I've kept that mentality for 10 years of, man, I really don't know anything. And then one time you get into a fishing tournament or something and you're like, man, I'm probably just going to get smoked at this, but I want to see kind of where I am. And you do pretty well in it. You're like, huh, how did that happen? I don't even know how that happened because I'm still the least experienced one here. I'm still the worst one here. But that weakness is strength has been kind of, I mean, I don't know. That's kind of how it was when we started Waypoint TV. I don't know anything about starting a television network. Sure. But the fact that I don't know anything about starting a television network is my greatest weakness. But it also turns out to be my greatest strength because I will do what you do. Immerse yourself in this. Find out everything that you possibly can. We have AI and Google in our back pockets now. We can anything is at your at your disposal. But you've been able to learn stuff really fast. And what what's the what's your secret to learning something really fast? Because you've done it in a bunch of different areas, and you're still doing it right now. I think it. Well, backing up, if it feels, it doesn't always feel really fast. Like sometimes it's it's (laughs) painful, (laughs) and it's so. I can think, I can remember this story and I'll tell you what I, my answer is, but I'll tell you a quick story. I go to ICAST. We have, most people listening probably knows ICAST. Um, I was working, uh, at the time for Hook and Nomad had just launched. I spent a year or two with them right out the gate, like before they were even a company, uh, wasn't working there anymore. That's a whole nother story. Um, so I go back and I had made, made the mistake of single sourcing my income to those people and doing everything for them. And I wasn't doing much else. So when that gets sideways, I'm left holding the bag. And I can remember going to iCast with, I own one red camera and enough hard drives to make it happen. And it's about three mics and I had my backpack and that was about it. And I walked into the room knowing that I needed to sell something like for real big time or I was going to have problems. And I remember just walking in there saying, okay, I know I'm not the best in the room at this. I never have thought that I was the best camera guy. I leaned on the fact that I had a camera ability and a lot of fishing knowledge. I was a tool there. Like I, I had a blended thing. Like I would never make you look bad on camera. I'd never put a bad cast in an edit. I know the rules. You're not a bad caster. In an eight hour fishing day, could I catch a bad cast? Of course I can. Like I know the game. I'm never going to make my guy look bad ever or girl. So I went into that and just said, okay, what is everyone else asking that? What, what can I ask that no one else is asking? And what I noticed was I was waiting. I'll tell you the company. It was Grundens, but I was waiting at Grundens and they were just about to blow up. They weren't where they are now. It was before Corey and all them took over and. I heard two people making a pitch before me to get the media. And I was like, okay, their pitch is exactly my pitch. Like, (laughs) oh, I'm fishing and I have a cool camera. And like, here's all the cool stuff I've done. What they didn't ask was, what do you need? What do you need? If you could hit an easy button and I could solve something from you and your business, what would it be? And I was like, I wonder what that is. So as I'm walking up to talk to the Grundens guy, and uh Captain Bill was there or whatever from the crab show. And I was like, that's cool. But anyway, <laughs> that aside, something just told me to ask the guy. And I I always told the truth. I was just like, listen, I, I told him the honest truth. I said, uh, the pitch I was going to give you is the same pitch those two guys gave before me. I just heard him. I'm standing right here. 
I said, what I want to know is you have a lot of problems to solve. You're the, you're the main guy at Grundens. You're dumping a pile of money into this, obviously. You're rebranding. You got new products coming out. That's clear. I see them. You have a lot more to worry about than content, branding, and marketing. A lot more. I want to worry about that. And I want you to worry about stuff that you want to worry about. So what do you need in a perfect world? What would make your life easy? What do you wish you had right now? And he told me the answer. And I left that day. I said, I will provide all that. Here's my track record. Please call about me. You know, I'm not a flashy guy. I'm not trying to be famous or nothing. Please call these people. Uh, I would like to provide that. And this is the number I want to provide it to you for. And I'll put my name on it. Like, it'll be right. You're not going to get overages. You're not going to get out of scope. Like, I'm going to think about you every day. Every second of the day, I'm going to think about you until this is right. And he was like, all right, whatever. Kind of blows me off, but I ended up getting the job. I got that one <laughs> and I got power pole. But I walked into that building and I told myself, if I get 100 no's in the next three days, I'm going to get five yeses. And if I get five yeses, I stay alive. And if I get, I have to get a hundred no's. And I got damn near all, damn near a hundred no's, but I got five <laughs> yeses. And I forgot exactly. I did stuff for Power Pole. This was in there. They were about to launch that trolling motor that's now out, but mm -hmm. I started working on that and then ended up getting shifted over to the, the charge thing. Did a little bit of grunding stuff. A friend of mine threw me a bone on some fly fishing stuff and then can't remember what else, but I was just willing to just like tournament fishing. I was willing to lose and everyone else was going around looking for the winners. And I was like, my goal is to get 100 no's. It's like poker. If I play five hands. I can probably lose. If I play a hundred hands, I'm going to win a few of them. So I just, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just, and it wasn't like arrogance. It was very desperate, but I didn't come, I didn't try to come across desperate. I just asked them all. I just made up my mind that morning. It was eight eight fifteen at Grundens. I was like, I'm not giving them the same speech. Like I want to know, and you know, in your world, you got a lot going on. What do you wish you could take off your plate with somebody ca capable? You know what that answer is. And if I can yeah. help with that, let me do it. And I always gave them a. I'd put my own self on the line. I'd say I don't want a contract. You can pay me month to month. If at any point in time you think I'm sucking or not doing the job, just don't just fire me. There's no risk for you. And we got it. Wow. That's pretty cool. Um, it, it, so much of this reminds me of that book, uh, Mindset by Carol Dweck. Have you read that book? I have, yeah. Yeah, man. It's really awesome as far as raising kids, too. It's like, if it, it seems like you know, what we were talking about in the tournaments and, and people that don't want to compete in the tournaments because mm -hmm. they're afraid to lose, you know, they've been told all their, their career, you're a great fishing guide, you're a great angler. And, but they don't want to put it on the line because maybe they might lose, or maybe there's other reasons why they don't want to put it on the line. I don't know. Or maybe they just don't like competitive sure. fishing for whatever reason that that's all possible and to each their own. But, but there are also the situations to where someone is, is deep down in their in their soul, they're afraid that they'll be exposed and they're not going to be as good as everybody said they were. And um, it's not that bad. Like know. I wish people listening, like it's not the end of the world. Like it's okay. There's no, a lot of people that because are better you know than what you. happens. Call them. You know what happens. You. You know, yeah. You know what happens though you. when you when you get exposed and you and you are. I mean, I can think of the first thing you said when you came in second to last. Um, when Rich and I had started the professional redfish tournaments, we went to our first one, got second place, man. And we were thinking we are going to smoke this thing. <laughs> we knew we were going to be good at this. The next one is it across the state in a different fishery. We go there, we get second to last. Yep. We beat one person that caught nothing and we caught maybe <laughs> one fish and it was, I mean, we were trying to do things like we did at home sight fishing and we were sight fishing in these, in these zones where they were running the mullet boats. These were the most pressured, most spooky redfish I've ever seen in my life. Almost uncatchable. I mean, I had to, in a red professional redfish tournament, I had to go to a fly rod and like, six pound test and a mm. tiny fly to be able to even get something in the water 
that the fish would allow near them, and mm. one of them bit it, and we caught this little dinky little puppy drum that was barely able to make the tape, and that's what we brought in. It was a sad bag of fish that we brought into the scale, and that's when um, we knew, oh, we just got humbled like never before, and but guess what happened? Like, okay, how do we make sure that that never happens again? Who do we need to talk to? What do we need to learn? I w- we're going to go camp in that area until we are good at this type of fishing because this isn't the only place that that kind of thing happens. And if we intend to do this, we're going to have to learn how to how to do that. And once we learned how to do that, of course, you can take that back to our home water and apply the things we learned up there back to our home water. And now we're fishing for fish we didn't even know existed uh, before. So when you get exposed, it is very humbling and it sucks and it is damaging to the ego and it is depressing and you know but get over it and 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 just try to figure out what happened and everybody is better for it if you actually bounce back and keep going and that's really the difference between like what you were talking about about you're interested in what's the pivot you can fail all you want but what's the pivot what do you what what will you do from this point forward will you learn or are you going to take that and just just be depressed for the rest of the year? I don't know. How much better uh, do you think really you what, got? Like because of that experience on the West Coast, I bet your game doubled. Ten million yes. times better. Ten million times better. Plus, now I've failed at an epic level. So what? Now what? I'm going to be afraid to get last place. Now I'm not. Now I'm no longer afraid to get last place. I've already gotten second to last place in a national tournament. So, what, I mean, how much worse could it get? One place. That's as. That's how much worse it could get. I survived this. So now I know I can survive anything. Right. So I mean, okay, we get last place. Okay. So what? You know who remembers it too? You know? Only you. Probably. Well, Rich remembers Rich it. remembers it for sure, but <laughs> nobody thinks about the winners or even second place. And it's like, I fished a bass tournament this year. I've been fishing a big bass trail competitively, and I went to a lake, uh, Neely Henry. I did not catch a fish. I walked across. I know I had a bass fish. Like I, I walked across the stage with zero fish and was mortified and was like, I, well, I learned a tremendous amount. We'll save that for another time, but about stable water and this and that, but neither here nor there just terrible. I felt so bad the whole time. I was just like, unbelievable. The whole ride back, like 40 miles. I was just like, cool. Like, yeah, I'm in a $80,000 boat. Been doing this most of my life and I've got nothing, zero, but <laughs> nobody remembers it, but me. And no. I'm not afraid to, they don't even there. remember who got third place or fourth place in that tournament. Nobody knows. They only remember one person, that's a- the person that won and that's it. That's it. And second place or 50th place. Look, nobody remembers that. Now, it's nice to cash a check so you can continue to do what you love to do and what you're trying to do. But, you know, that's perspective. And, and honestly, kinda. the angler of the year, if you look at angler of the year, does does that person win more tournaments than anyone else? Usually not. Usually not. It's the person that gets a consistent eighth, ninth, fourth, you know, in the top 20 in every single tournament, you could win angler of the year and a lot of different things. Maybe it's the top 10. I don't know, but it's a consistent placing that gets you angler of the year. And a lot of people, uh, will, will put more credence on who wins angler of the year than they will, who wins a single tournament, even if that's the Bassmaster classic or one of the really big ones. It's like, but the, but the real champion of the season is the angler of the year. This guy, he placed in every single tournament. Maybe he didn't win a single one, but, that's that's consistency and that that's uh making sure that you never you never you know just torpedo it yourself and that you're doing something and there's a lot to be said for that like you can go to any body of water anywhere under any weather condition and you're still going to be one of the top 10 that could, that's pretty impressive consistencies man it's everything and i can remember it took me a while um when I was guiding, so when I was policing, I guided because I knew how to trout. I needed the money and I like trout fishing. So, but I can remember it took me, I'd be curious how long, if you ever thought about this, I'm sure you did, but it took me probably two years to realize that my idea of a good day on the water was like 60 or 70 trout. Like that's what I wanted, but that's not everyone else's good idea. Like some people were just like, Hey, I get to go out one day a year. Like I just want to catch some fish and not be on my phone. 
So it took me a while to start to really kind of hone in as a guide, like, what do you want out of this day? You know, like, because just because I want to do something doesn't mean you do like, and that, that was something that, you know, I think about that too. It's like that versatility, that consistency, it made me better. And, you know, a lot of my guide friends would always be like, why do you offer it? Like, why do you ask them what they want to do? And I'm like, I don't know, boredom. I get challenged. Like you tell me you want to catch a fish over 22 inches. Like I'm shifting my day differently. So, well, that's, that's a good guide though. That's, that's what I talk about on this podcast so much is that, um, you know, so much of being a good guide is not necessarily what your skill level is or what your, or what your, uh, water is, or even, even what your, you know, how many fish you catch. It's communication with your angler to make sure that you're showing that person the best day that they have ever had. And that is an opinion from them. Like maybe they want to go out and catch a whole bunch of fish and be back by noon. And if you take them out until 730 that night, it's too much. They don't want that. Right. But another guy does or another girl does. They want to go sunrise to sunset, right? But if you don't communicate with somebody, you can take somebody out there and just beat them to death. And they were having a great time at 11 o'clock. And it was the best day they had ever had. But by 7 they're done. They have been done and they thought they were, and now they're in trouble with, with their family because they stayed out too late. And not only did they not really have a good time, but next time they go on vacation, they're not going to be able to go fishing with you because last time you kept them out too late. I just like, didn't ask the simple question. Things, right. Of yeah. What is, tell me what a great day is in your opinion, man, we would love to catch some fish and have this beautiful lunch that we prepared. And we'd love to be back by two 30. I mean, what if somebody told you that? Right. Okay, would that affect the the river that you chose, or sure. or or the place that you chose to fish, or 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 what? And then another person comes and says, "Man, I'm here for permit on fly. That's it." So you pull out the spinning rod and say, "Okay, well, first we're going to catch some jacks on spin." And they're like, "Uh, no, no, this isn't what I, this isn't what I'm here for." But then the the person comes with their kids, and they're like, "Man." We just need to keep the rods bent. Okay, we're catching some jacks on spin, and they're having the best day they've ever had. And you can do the same thing with different people and have a terrible day or a great day. And it's all about what that person wants to do. And usually that communication happens months ahead of time, honestly. And that and you book the right trip, the trip that you want to take as a fishing guide and the trip that they want to take as an angler. And if those meet together... You're probably going to find a, a, a long-term relationship with that client, right? I found, too, I, a friend of mine, a bunch of them still guide full-time, and we talk about it. Everyone talks about getting burned out. Everyone that's ever guided gets to a point where they're like, I've had, I'm, I'm tired, you know? <laughs> Everyone has. <laughs> but I tell them the same thing. I'm like, dude, why don't you just – I used to get heat for it, but I tell them, like, I want to teach you enough to where you don't need me. And they're like, oh, they're never going to come back. I was like, they always came back. I had, until I quit guiding full time, I had as much business as I wanted. And I was like, dude, ask them what they want to do. Like, I remember I had a guy one time, I fished with him all the time. He was actually the guy that taught me how to spay cast. He since died. He was a eye surgeon out of Georgia. He said, I want to catch carp on a fly. Do you know much about it? I said, no, not really. He's like, well, you know, carp. I said, kind of. He's like, you know how to cast. I said, yeah. He's like, you have a skiff. I said, yeah. He's like, let's do it. I said, I can't promise nothing. He said, nothing's promised for nothing. Let's go. I said, all right. So that's what I tell those guys too. I was like, just ask them what you want to do. Like, you know, they, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't like a world where I'm just banging down the river, doing the same thing over and over. And I, I don't know if saltwater's that way. You'd know way better than me, but it seems like, you know, we run the risk as trout guys of getting stuck a little bit in a rut. I feel like, mm -hmm. you know, if you're coming out of marathon or wherever you're coming out of, you got a lot of options and, you know, versatility is king. And I, I don't know. I just get fired up about that stuff. And I look at, now, can, can you get caught in a rut? Yeah. There's, there's like in certain places, there's three fish. People are fishing for permit bonefish or tarpon. Mm -hmm. And that's great. And some people that's all they want to do, but there's literally 50 other species that you can fish for. And there are cold fronts that come in and, and there are tournaments for these other fish. And I, I don't know, I, I kind of, uh, when, when I, uh, 
felt the most refreshed of any time in my whole career was when my kids got old enough to fish and, and I had a bay boat and I'd get out of the skiff and I'd take my kids fishing. We're fishing yeah. around mangroves and doing snapper fishing and stuff like that. Well, now we're catching redfish under the bushes and it's like, huh, I had no idea these existed. Let's go, let's go buzz around every one of these mangrove islands and see what we can find. And you know what? We found all kinds of things that were, that I had no idea. And then that's kind of what I wanted to do for a while. Like, wow, this is now I'm exploring again, That's right? Fun. Like this is, this is a new thing and, and I'm, I'm sharing it with my kids and they're having a good time. And that just, you know, extended my career by years, you know, because I was excited about it again. And then, you know, two or three days of that, and I was ready to go back and fly fish for tarpon, you know? That's but, interesting. That's, an, I, that's interesting to hear. I like that. I mean, it's, I don't, we don't have that versatility where I live, but it's, you know, I look at just the opportunity to explore and do other things. And, you know, I remember I've done a couple of guided trips in the Keys or in Florida years ago. And I remember telling the guy, I just said, it was weird, but I remember telling the guy, I was like, take me to what you would do if you had a day off. Nice. And he said, well, what do you want to catch? I was like, I've not caught a million, tar I've caught some, I've caught a few things here and there. I was like, I love catching anything. I mean, I mean that like brim, whatever it is, there's certain things like I prefer to catch tarpon on a fly rod, but I've caught them on gear. I prefer to catch bonefish on a fly rod, but I've caught them on jigs. So I said, just whatever you want to go, like, what would you do if I wasn't here and let's go fishing? Like, that's, that's what I want. And we were, we went grouper fishing in really shallow water one time. And we did some grouper trolling, which was, weird but awesome and then mm -hmm. another time we did it and then we we went offshore and he had a small i i don't even remember his name that's terrible i normally have a good memory <laughs> alex or something but we he liked daytime sword fishing and his boat was pretty small and he's like are you into it i was like i'm into whatever you're into and we went out there and just learning how to set up with the current it's not what i thought it was 1500 feet was like the most intense nymphing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> and uh, we caught one, like a small one, but we caught one. And I was just like, dude, this is awesome. Like how you have to drive the boat around. You don't just drop it down and hope for Maybe people do, but this guy wasn't just dropping it down and hoping for the best. Like it was very technical and I was all over it. I was like, this is awesome. Like just the light set up and I don't, yeah. I don't want to give away his secrets, but first, it was super cool. Well, the first time I did that, I was I was shocked and amazed that it took uh, like 10 minutes for an eight pound weight to yeah. hit the bottom. <laughs> you know, you're just sitting there letting line spool off the reel for 10 minutes. It's uh, it's incredible. Um, I didn't see the bite. He's like, there he is. There he is. I was like, what? I was looking for birds or something. Yeah, but it was no. the I didn't even see the rod. He's like, he's on. Yeah, like, it's what? very it's very subtle, but man, those guys that that do that, they never take their eye off that off the 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 tip. I mean, it'd be like it'd be like somebody going nymphing with you and not not looking at your at your indicator or your <laughs> your your you know your different color mono or whatever you call it, um, and and being like, oh, I don't even know how you got a bite. It's like, well, because I've never taken my eye off of this thing for the since we got out here. Um, but that's what those guys do. Um, he was well, Paul, man, proficient. I know you, uh, I know you are on your drive and I want to finish this up. I hope it's not going to be the last time that we do this. I, I mean, I feel yeah. like we're barely scratching the surface, uh, on, on you and your experience and what you can, um, tell our, tell our audience. But if you were to, you know, give somebody that is, uh, looking to, to become a better angler, whether that's fly fishing or, or bass fishing or, or whatever, you're, or or maybe it's somebody that that's looking to start a new business. You have done that. You've done both of these things very well and in a very short period of time. If you were to give somebody one or two pieces of advice, um, what w what would it be? Okay, so I'll start with fishing, and I can't take credit for it. It came from Larry Dahlberg, but he said, "Fishing is a world, and you look through the world through keyholes." If the only keyhole you ever look through, and I'm guilty of this, I'll raise my hand, is fly fishing only. That's the only keyhole you ever see fishing from. Learn how to deep drop. Learn what fish, what UV light fish see in 1500 feet or don't see. Learn why, you know, you can, you can catch bonefish on an outgoing. Figure out where and why. Why does grass shrimp matter? Why does 
you know, chrome work on top water. Like look through as many keyholes as you can to be a good angler. Don't just, don't be just the bass guy. Like so many bass fishermen only bass fish. Like explore the world a little bit, right? And that's kind of what I've been doing over the last five, six, seven years, just seeing what else is out there and taking all that knowledge. Am I, do I want a deep drop every day? I don't, but it's tremendously interesting when you don't know anything about it. Um, on the business side, I would say that authenticity is a powerful qualifier. Like don't, if, if it's authentic and you know it, don't be afraid of it. And then just, it sounds lame, but like, be honest. Like I'm leery of somebody that thinks they know everything. Like I want to be around people that trust the process and know they can figure it out. I don't expect you to have the answer, but I expect you to be able to figure it out. You know? And for me, that's it. Like if you can't figure it out and you can't pivot and you can't grow, like what's, what's the point? So, you know, for me, that's, that's kind of my thing is just be authentic and be willing to fail. Like that's not a, that's not a, you know, what am I word I'm looking for? It's not a, you're not allowed to be reckless, but learn the basics and be willing to apply the basics and be willing to fail. Like most people can benefit what the greatest thing they benefit from in business, whether it's marketing or branding, isn't complicated things. It's just an absolute trust in the basics and implementing the basics. Going back to Humphreys, Al Kite, stop the rod tip high. Humphreys, the basics, practice perfection. Like the basics work. So obsess over the basics and see how they apply. Like the things we could get into it, we won't, but all great companies are applying the basics with authenticity. So. I love it. I love it. There's a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of wisdom and knowledge in that. And, uh, I hope that, uh, we can get together, um, again, and I wish you the very best on your trip to Key Largo. Thank you. Thank you. You're going to have an awesome time, man. You're going to be down there with your kids. They're going to be able to catch all different kinds of fish. We have a, a a game that I played with my kids, um, all growing up. And that was who could catch the weirdest fish. Ooh, and uh I like it. it's a it's a great thing you get somebody a, a hound fish or a or a puffer fish or something like that they'll never forget it their entire life you catch them 12 bone fish and they really don't care um, but if you can catch them something that's super colorful or super weird or has super giant teeth that is the winner for anybody that's pretty much under the age of about 20. um Noted. <laughs> yeah, man. But who can catch the weirdest fish? That's that's I'm one game it. you can play. All right, I'm stealing it right now on Wednesday. <laughs> the Tom Roland Weird Fish Challenge. It's going down. I love it. I love it, man. Well, Paul, thanks, man. I really yes, appreciated sir. this phone call and um, and and talking to you. And let's do it again. We'll do. It. Thank you, boys. All right. See ya. See ya.